Right, so there are, there are quite a few, um, of course, little uh, minor issues in the budget. I'll come on to what I see as five, um, five things I think regard as most important in a moment, but maybe I'll just um, briefly touch on a few of uh, minor things of interest. Of course, there was this uh, idea of having a statement of, your, uh, of what all of your taxes are spent upon. Um, that could make some difference to how people think of things if they actually read it. I suspect most people won't bother reading it, so it won't actually make that much difference at all, but why not try it? Uh, a generalised anti-avoidance rule is, I think, a bad thing, uh, an attack on property rights, which is why these kinds of things haven't been brought in in the past. Uh, I actually think that if you were to implement it in a way which met the aspiration, uh, it would prove to be quite a significant impingement on property rights, which means that they probably won't do that, and there will continue to be ways for people to avoid taxes, mercifully. Uh, the empty banker bashing continues. Uh, I mean, really, what is the point of exempting the banks from the effects of a corporation tax rise other than being able to have five seconds of glory uh, of back bashing a banker in the budget? There's no, it's an entirely empty gesture. Uh, I don't really see what the point of that is, but they carry on doing that because it's fun for politicians. Um, there's, uh, there's this measure up, which I thought of as, uh, in terms of video games and so on, which I thought of as the Angry Birds 2 policy, presumably influenced by uh, Cameron's appetite for mobile phone game apps, and perhaps in advance of the Angry Birds space launch today, apparently, which I'm told is one of the things coming in. I thought it would be called the Angry Birds policy, though um, Paul War uh, managed to um, name it in grab the name in terms of Grand Theft Osbo, connecting that with the, uh, with the granny tax, which has already been described earlier. Um, there was the, uh, to the joy of all finance students, uh, the government's planning to issue some more uh, consoles, which of course are where the yield is much easier to measure uh, than those which actually pay uh, out of final redemption. So um, obviously my students would have been pleased at that once upon a time. Um, there was also a lot of fuss uh, uh, about this rise in stamp duty, um, this not really a mansion tax, uh, which is going to apply to perhaps you know, 1,500, 2,000 transactions a year in the context of a £126 billion budget deficit. That ain't going to save us. We're not going to balance the budget on that. But so there are various things of that sort. I, some people complain about those and many other little bits of tinkering big lists of this and that local measure. I, I'm fine with that kind of thing in a budget. I don't see why they, that's all for the Chancellor to do because, of course, the things he does impact on us at the micro level as well as in terms of the big epic level. So this is his chance to talk about those things. But if I, I'll prefer to focus most of my remarks on some big issues. So the first of the big issues I always identify is that I think the centerpiece of this budget is the embedding of the most radical tax reforming aspect of the coalition, which is the large rise in the personal allowance. In fact, I think that in, on the uh, economy side, the government is likely to be remembered as a government that reduced the deficit and raised the personal allowance. Other kinds of things, 50p rates and so on, nobody will even remember what the numbers were. But over the long term, they will remember that there was a very significant change in the philosophy of how you dealt with income tax issues. Whereas in the, um, from the late 80s through the 1990s, there was an idea that if you were going to do anything on income tax, the way that you did it was by cutting rates. We've now shifted dramatically to the idea that if you're going to cut income tax in some way, what you do is that you raise the personal allowance. As an advocate of that, one of the earliest advocates of that idea, as far as I'm aware, I wrote things about this in 2000 and argued for it continuously through, I have a slight resentment to the idea that this is a uh, Lib Dem concept, uh, but uh, on the other hand, it was certainly, I think, the case that it's come in because of Lib Dem politicians, so I think we should concede that absolutely. I think there's um, actually, although loads and loads of Conservatives argued for it, I don't think it would have been very likely to be implemented by a Conservative government. So it's definitely the Lib Dem politicians can claim the prize for implementing a Conservative idea. Um, the, uh, the thing that's going along with that, though, is that there will be a um, large rise in the number of higher rate taxpayers. Uh, which, so what we're talking about from the latest measures is something like an additional 300,000. That takes you to around um, 4 million higher rate taxpayers something like of order one-eighth of taxpayers. And that's quite a lot. And about 41,000 after the various changes, that's going to put you within striking distance of um, what the Halifax identifies as the uh, average full-time income of um, males. I presume that that's of, which, which they put at 37,500. I presume that's of full-time male um, homeowners, since the ONS says the average uh, income of full-time males is 33,500, but even if it's just of all the homeowners, I mean, that gives, gives you an idea that 
uh, what we're talking about here when we're talking about a 41,000 rate for the threshold is something well within striking distance of what a very large proportion of people would at the very least aspire to have as their income in life, if, if, even if they don't necessarily have it now. And I think that changes some of the political calculus um, about uh, taxes in a, in a way, again, which is almost as important as the rise, this switch, the rise in the personal allowance, which is because you have so many people affected by the higher rate, either genuine, uh, either directly or in aspirational terms, that will change, I think, the political calculus of the changes to that higher rate relative to changes in the basic rate. I think that much of the politics of the basic rate is probably um, uh, gone away for a while. Uh, it, it might come back if they raise the rate, as I hope they will in due course, but um, I don't expect that to happen any time soon. The next thing that I would emphasise in terms of big picture is that the planned spending cuts are getting deeper and deeper all the time. So on leaving office, the Labour Party had planned to cut deficit by 73 billion by 2014-15, including 52 billion of spending cuts. So they scheduled um, and told us what they were, but they had in mind to cut 52 billion. In the June 2010 emergency budget, um, the Chancellor, the coalition, extended that to 128 billion from 73 to 128 billion of deficit reduction, of which 99 billion were spending cuts. So the spending cuts up from 52 to 99. By November last year, the plan was to cut the deficit by 147 billion by 2016-17, including 116 billion. So that was a further 17 billion of spending cuts, 116 billion then. Yesterday, they told us that the total deficit reduction plan is now 155 billion, including 126 billion of spending cuts. So a further 10 billion. They're announcing more and more spending cuts all of the time. Of course, they're telling us less and less about them, and they're shoving them off further and further into the future. So now we've got um, some 47 billion of additional spending cuts for after the next general election. So in theory, the Conservatives and the um, Lib Dems are now promising to go into the next general election on the basis that in the first two years, if you elect us, in the first two years, in addition to all the spending cuts we did this Parliament, we're going to put another 47 billion spending cuts in. Well, all I can say politically, good luck with that. Um, but uh, maybe the environment, maybe the political environment will have changed so much that by the next election that's a winner. But it's, it's all, I would have thought the natural thing to do was, once you were elected, to have implemented your spending cuts early. Uh, right, but that, that was what I recommended, but that's not the way that things worked out. Um, the fourth thing that I would emphasize is that the OBR has downgraded its estimate of the sustainable growth rate of the economy again. And in many ways, this is the most important. This is really, over the medium term, just the biggest aspect of all of these things. So as of June 2010, it thought that the sustainable growth rate of the economy was um, about 2.3% a year, falling to about 2.1% a year. So that was from about 2.5% historically. So that was a bit of a fall, but they thought there'd been a bit of a fall away, um, but not an enormous one. Uh, by last November, they revised that down fairly dramatically and said that since the period of the financial crisis, the sustainable growth rate had been only around 1% a year. But it would risen to 1.2%, it would rise to 1.2% in 2012, and then back up to about 2.3% by, uh, by the middle of the parliament. Yesterday, they revised that down again to 0.8%. Now, just to give you the idea of what this means, so that might seem a bit kind of, what's going on with that? Well, if you grow at 2% a year versus 1% a year, then after a decade, your economy is 10% bigger. So that's one aspect of things. A second point to think about there is that if the sustainable growth rate is really only 0.8%, that means that 2011 and 2012, each of which are where the growth rate's about, 0.8%, aren't bad growth years. Right? We have this idea that, the, that those are terribly slow growth years. But what the OBR is saying is that those aren't terribly slow growth years at all. The economy was growing in line with its potential growth rate in those years. Any faster, and the effects would have been inflation, you'd have had, because we would have had a problem setting aside a minor issue with the output gap. But Fundamentally, what they're saying is that the reason uh, we can interpret this as meaning that the reason the economy is growing slowly is nothing to do with any failure of policy or anything of that sort. It's growing slowly because it can only grow slowly. Its capacity for growing is very slow at the moment. If that were to persist over the whole parliament, if you were to only get about 1% growth a year over the whole parliament, you will find that inexorably households will start to default on their debts because their income will not rise fast enough. That will drive the banks into bankruptcy, and that in turn will place the UK sovereign into considerable difficulties. 
So uh, George Osborne should go to sleep every night dreaming of ways to increase the sustainable growth rate and he should wake up every morning planning to implement them and then go to bed the next night fearing he didn't do enough. Because at the moment, all he's really doing on that is cutting the rate of spending. There are other things he could be trying, but really the only material thing he's doing on that is cutting the rate of spending. That's something, but it's not enough. The other thing about that is, if he does only get 0.8% a year growth, or 1% a year growth, if it doesn't increase the way that the OBR thinks that it will over the next couple of years, he's not going to get anywhere near his fiscal targets. His fiscal mandate is just going to be blown out of the water. So he utterly, his whole program utterly depends upon that sustainable growth rate rising. And he's doing almost nothing to achieve that as things stand. The fifth thing that I would note, which I think is of potential importance, is that oil prices are forecast in the um, OBR's forecast to rise much faster than they previously thought. So in November 2011, they thought oil prices would be around $105 a barrel in 2012, falling to 101 in 2013. Now they forecast $118 a barrel in 2012, falling to 112 in 2013. If there were to be fear, further deterioration of political conditions in Syria and Iran, then those could prove to be highly optimistic. In sterling terms, oil prices have recently been above their 2008 peaks. So if you measure it in pounds rather than in dollars, oil prices are at an all-time high. So all this notion, so a lot of the thoughts about why inflation was liable to fall away was because various base effects, you thought that what had happened was that there were some one-off spikes up in oil prices, and if those dropped away, then you'd find that um, the inflation fell away. If the oil prices go up again, then we will find that in due course the inflation goes up. Now, the OBR isn't projecting that yet. In fact, they slightly downgraded their outlook for inflation. But uh, I think that that is a material risk. There are, it's, and that's part of, a, of a, a point that actually a lot of things about this budget, key factors about this budget, are the things he didn't say because they're events out with his control entirely. He doesn't have any control over whether the Eurozone completely breaks up. He doesn't have any control over whether there's a, a, a war in Syria and Iran. He doesn't have any control over whether there's, there, was, there were rumours yesterday of a coup in China, right, from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Those kind of events... Problems, further problems in the US, or even policy. If the US does even more QE, then that could have a big impact on inflation internationally. These kind of events are beyond his control. At the moment, he's skating very close to the edge. Everything, it's just about doable, this program. He, if, he's, if things go well, he can just about sneak us through. But everything's right on the edge. And I find it extraordinary that we, have, we had these discussions um, when, when everything was downgraded last November, the political, the policy discussion, the discussion in the press, virtually nobody was saying, well, he's downgrading, so therefore he should do more further tax rises and spending cuts. But as soon as we had a few, a couple of months of um, slightly better than expected stories on the, on the fiscal side, and people started saying, well, there's 5 billion better or 10 billion better looking on the deficit, suddenly everybody's talking about a giveaway. It's exactly that kind of asymmetry. But whenever ever, anything goes badly, you say, well, it's just temporary, we'll shrug past it. But whenever anything goes well, you say, let's spend it. That's the kind of psychology that got us into this. We have to build buffers to ensure ourselves against bad events, because there are a lot of bad events out there that can happen and totally derail this thing yet.